You're on mute, my friend. Dave Figgett, for your for your uh, information. So we've had <clears throat> uh, we had a meeting with Dave and Cree at uh, I can't remember the name of the place, but anyway. Um, Interesting. Uh, Bob Milleberg was the one that made the introduction here, and uh, but anyway, uh, they, we we got into the to the weeds of the technology uh, with Dave and, and Cree, and so now I'm 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 guessing Sean, Bruce, and Ben are the Alex are the technology guys, um, and we we've never been able to give them the dashboard. Um, do you see somebody's waiting to get in? Yeah, I, just, I let him in. Let him in. So, um, what they really want, and, and Dave and Creed, correct me, uh, but they really want to see the dashboard and how that fits into their, into what they're doing with uh, with collections, and and then being also one being able to give that to the people, but also monitor the people and then help them make their payment on the collection industry. And uh, so they're, what they really want to see today is the dashboard. And then uh, my conversation with Cree was uh, uh, next step is how do we tie into the APIs uh, to our product? Did I cover that cor correctly, Preston? You're muted. I keep doing that. Yeah, I thought <laughs> it was a great path. Um, yeah, I think that uh, we're excited to see if there's a good path to um, supply the extra data that we have, but fundamentally at the baseline, you guys also need to be able to either accept those transactions through yourself and deposit it to your partners or be able to have those partners underwritten to accept um, underneath their own accounts, but accounts that you guys manage. So deciding on the path you guys want to be able to take um, and understanding a little bit the workflow as you build that of who's going to be sending the communications, how are those going to accept, and then how you want those tracked and those tr those individual recurring transactions to be set up if they are recurring or one-time transactions, where you want the money to flow. We also talked a little about, bit about split payments that if you wanted to set it up where you have a flat, call it a flat cost for supplying this, so let's call that 5% for an easy number. If I'm collecting $100 from someone, it's 5% whenever you whenever you collect money for them, even if it's a payment plan over multiple months, do we want to pull that fee that you're gonna charge them as a flat rate out and deposit that to you and then deposit them the balance? There's ways that we can set things up like that. Or if it's, nope, we want the money to go to them and then we'll bill them at the end of the month. So there's multiple different kind of pieces to think through before deciding which integrations you want and need and are going to best function your services. And there's flexibility that we can adjust those as we go, right? Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to say yes. Um, the, the only difficulty that's going to come into that is if we're talking the split payment part, that gets built as part of the contract with the merchant. So if we're underwriting ABC collection company and you have an agreement to bill them 5% of whatever you collect, and we're going to split that off and pay you, we have to build that as part of the contract. So that's a little bit harder because then we got to go back to them and change the contract that they have for us to be able to have our banks split those fees out. Where anything else kind of outside of that, deciding on where you're going to send it, who you're going to send it, if you're going to underwrite it, they're going to underwrite it, how you want that, those are a bit easier to change rather than that specific piece of taking a part of their money before we deposit it to them. Gotcha. Dave, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, I think, you know, at least for this first go, um, we just want to take the easiest path, which I, I'm thinking would be just to underwrite us. And, you know, at least for our pilot phase that we're working on, we'll just have the money come straight to us and then we'll manage the money movement after that with the respective clients, at least for our first two or three. Yeah, I think that's right. We, we, you and I should probably just ask uh, Bob in the next couple of days if he has a strong feeling one way or the other, and assuming he doesn't, then yeah, I think that'd be simpler. And just as a point of reference, I'm sure you guys can see it, but split payments are preferred in the sense of you don't have to be beholden to anybody. Once, once the payment goes through, you're paid, and that's what's important. Right. Well, yeah. in this scenario, you get all the money up front. 
and you're paying them the balance. So now you own all the money. But that is, again, we talked about the risk of that piece, right? Which says charge backs and yeah. Yeah, long term, you're going to want to have your partner be the one that's underwritten and responsible for those funds. Even a split payment, right, in that scenario, split payment says you got your money. They're responsible for any chargebacks or anything that happened. That's going to be pulled out of their account, not your account. When you're underwritten, it's your bank account attached to this. And so funds going in and out of there are all going to be based off of your bank account. So you could even make that transition, right? You could say, and you, you could start this path and say, okay, we allow our partners to collect through us and we'll deposit to you up to $10,000 a month or $50,000, you know, whatever that number is. But once you hit that threshold of work collecting higher than that, you have to go through the underwriting process to get your own account so that we can shift that liability. And on the legal side of things, you may want to look at that. And so then once you get, you're getting close to that line, you get to go back and say, hey, look, we're collecting for you, you know, $40,000 a month. We're getting close. We need to get you under it so we can now transfer the account so that it's into your account and then do a split or, or we'll bill you at the end of the month. But we're not willing to hold more than an X amount of liability for you or something like that. So you kind of can think through how you want that to function. It's good to know we've got that flexibility. Yeah. Yeah. So then the only, the other piece, so as we talk through, let's, Let's take the first step, which says, we're going to underwrite you. You're going to have your account to be able to do X amount, X whatever. And today we're starting with one client. So that one client, we would set them up a gateway account that is specific to them. And inside that, we're going to set up. That's the part where the descriptor comes in, where we say, where we want to have whoever the collection company is, let's call it collection A, you know, ABC, you're going to want their name in the descriptor showing up on the merchant's bank account because they just clicked the agree button and they got a letter from abc but when the bill comes out it's going to show your name right so we want to somehow have the descriptor built out and we only have a certain number of characters and i'll get that character list and we're going to want to probably say collection abc company billed by you guys right that way when the person's in there it's not a confusion of who just billed me a hundred dollars for this payment plan, I'm like they're not going to know what it's for. And when we communicate to them that they're doing that, if it's going to an account, like so let's then say that on this first one, everything's going through you guys, you're going to want to notate when they click the pay button, just know this is being billed by so-and-so billing, right? Once you make the transition where it's that company's own account, you won't have to worry about that because it will show just their name. It won't show your name on the descriptor because you're no longer on that liability list. As you move forward and have multiple more clients, we would just create a new gateway account, same integration you've done in the first place, just a new gateway ID, which has a different descriptor and for that different company. So that helps you separate the billings per company, as well as make sure the descriptor is correct for the individual merchant each time. Hey, hey Preston, since I wasn't in the initial discussion, just quick question and clarification. So on the gateway account that you set up, um, Cree and his group would be able to look at each individual agency on a separate basis, but also have a full uh, summary of all of their partners who are doing it, right? Yeah, so inside of the eight software and what your API will be able to hit inside and pull data from the, from our software side of things, it can be aggregate and split out. And that's just, you know, clicking the right, clicking the right accounts you want to look at all at once. So that's the reporting side of things. The, the gateway side of things or how that transaction is being submitted to the issuing bank is different from that. Those are going to have to be unique individual separate accounts that we set up, even though it's underneath your one big, what we call a mid or a merchant ID, your one big umbrella, you're going to have individual, what we call terminal IDs. That terminal ID would be for, you know, ABC company, one, two, three company, you know, collection, I'm the best person in the world company, whatever it is, we'd want individual ones of those. And the reason why that's going to be important is that defines the descriptor as well as the deposit, right? You're going to have one mid that you're getting a big deposit to, but that deposit is going to hold monies from potentially, let's call five different partners that you have. What that terminal ID does is that lets us easily say, 
boom, here's your report. This much money was for this person, this much money was for this person, this much money was for this person. So you don't have to track that on the back end. We're already tracking that. Gotcha. That's what I asked the question. Yeah, I think I think uh, that's good for us. Um, uh, and again, I think, uh, you know, unless one of our partners, one of our beta customers tells us otherwise, we'll go with the more just the straightforward approach for now. And then as we start bringing on other clients, we can have that conversation of different structuring and taking yeah. that path. We'll definitely I, I definitely want to take your recommendations as to best practices on that. Um, but for for this time being, easy, straightforward is, yep. is the path we want for now. It's good, better, best world, right? Yep. What's what's best for your clients, what you get to do first, and then what's best for you is kind of a little bit after that. Um, yeah, that's, that's awesome. So maybe a couple questions to ask to help define next steps for you guys. Number one, timeline. Do you have a timeline when you're like, this is when we're gonna send out our first thing that could accept transactions? Um, best case scenario, uh, about two months. Okay, great. So um, underwriting for something kind of like this, we'll jump into that. I would expect a couple weeks just due to, because you're doing third party billing for somebody else, even though the money's coming to you, there, there's a couple of you know, items that we in the bank review on that, but we can get that going right away. We can get you guys active on to kind of whichever gateway, and we'll decide that in just a minute here today, right? I can get you guys access to that. So your developers can start hitting the API to be able to, and that API is the sending a transaction. So the customer says, pay now, pops up the hosted payments page. That makes it so you guys don't have to hold PCI compliance, any of that sort of stuff pops up, they put their card information in, goes through, tokenizes it, and sets up the the recurring billing. So if it's a five day, I mean a five month thing, it'll set up for five months, the same amount for over the five month period, right? Um, so that's the transaction side of things. And then once you've got that done and we have transactions running through there, then you've got the API into our eight reporting system that's gonna be the larger part where when you guys are ready to kind of look at larger data sets of what comes in on a on a transaction, we can send that to you. You can look at, okay, yeah, we would like to be able to see this, 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 this. Um, but right off the bat, it's available in our reporting tool. So you can look at that and say, yep, yeah, I wanna consume this data, do our own analytics, how you wanna manage that. We can start playing with that right away as well. So integrations we can do right away. Um, underwriting, we'll start that right away and get you guys an account up here ASAP. And then uh, you'll be good to, Kind of start running transactions as soon as you want. Awesome. Big questions on any of that stuff? I'm good. Anybody else? I know you wanted to see the dashboard. Yeah, <clears throat> it's exciting. Yeah. Well, here, let's, uh, we can do the dashboard real quick. Yeah. So, one, one more question, real quick. Um, when you're building this out, um, and I'm trying to, I mean, I, I'm sure I've built my own imagination of what you're building. So if I'm sending either a text or an email, inside of there is gonna be a you know, potential proposal of a payment plan or a one-time payment, something like that. And so let's, I'm imagining, let's say you give them three options, pay us once this amount, pay us over three months this amount, pay us over six months this amount, something like that. Is that kind of the right vision that I'm seeing? More that or less, yeah. Yeah. yeah, at a very high level. Okay. Yep. Awesome. So um, with with something like that, um, uh, you're accepting uh, either, let's see, if they're doing it on their phone or they're doing it on their computer, you're accepting an e-commerce transaction, which is good. That's, that's better than accepting a, a keyed transaction for someone that called in, which is also another place where these guys will save money because it costs them less to run the transaction. Um, and so I would suggest that we use NMI as your gateway. Um, they're, the, they're the cheapest, it's uh, five cents a transaction, so they're not very expensive at all on the transaction side of things. Um, and then they are very, very good at allowing us to add many, many, many gateways or, or accounts underneath one gateway. 
And so that's going to probably be the best one as you look to broaden and have more than one partner to be able to use the same system. You guys have reporting overview over everybody's stuff. So that's a good path there. Their API is really easy. Um, and not uh, actually, I wouldn't foresee that you're you're doing any collections with businesses unless you do. I don't know if you see that very often. Is it more individuals or businesses? Presumably, oh, sorry, individuals. individuals. Okay, great. So, yeah, NMI is the best one. Uh, we can get you guys a, a test sandbox account into that uh, by the end of the day if you want it, or I just need a little bit of information. I'll just email you guys and say, hey, we need this to be able to set the account up, who's going to manage that account, that sort of stuff. But um, that's, I think that's a pretty easy next step for you guys to be able to start getting some integration and playing on that API side of things. Preston, who would be their contact at uh, eight that they would work with to get that API set up? Um, I'll send an email and intro. I'll, I'll, it'll just be the support team, and I'll send that out to whoever on your guys' side wants to kind of be the liaison on this side. Um, oh, would that be Dave, you, or, or Cree? Probably Cree. 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 Okay. Yep. Cool. Yeah, so you'll just get an email from me. Um, uh, and going to our support team who do all our setups and that sort of stuff. Um, and so they'll get the setup done, and then you'll also get an email from me along with myself and our underwriting team um, and David and Paul to be able to go through the, the underwriting side of things, get app set up and the information that we need to be able to get that, that part set up. So two different emails, one getting the test account set up for API stuff, and then one getting the account set up is a different department. Do you have Cree's contact, Preston? Mm, it's probably listed inside this invite, would be my oh, guess. Sure. Yeah. yeah, it should be. I'll make sure you get it if you don't. Okay, yeah. I'm opening this up. Um, yeah, I'm not seeing it yet. Yeah, shoot that over to me so I can get that going. Yeah. Um, and we'll go from there. And then, Dave, I'll, David Figgett, I'll copy you on that just so you have that as well. And I've already got it. It's okay. Okay. Yep, you do. Thank you. And then Dave's got the uh, dashboard up and running right now. So, um, it, it, as you were talked uh, in your initial discussion, uh, we really are not just a processor. <laughs> we're a data science company. I think it's going to bear fruit when you see this. <clears throat> so, this is a dashboard of an an actual client. Um, they're a SaaS model company. <clears throat> recurring billing, they manage um, dental and orthodontic offices, uh, you know, a monthly payment autom uh, automates everything in the office from the scheduling of the doctors to the dental hygienists to tracking all their inventory to reordering, blah, blah, blah. So these guys bill on a cycle of every four weeks. What you're looking at is a, is a dashboard, just like a dashboard of any any kind of activity. Uh, this shows, you know, you can see the the, the recurring monthly billings here. Uh, it's graphically shows the amount that the transactions, 475 transactions, the amounts, they have their declines here, returns. And so it's a real easy way just to kind of get a picture. And it, this works a lot like a pivot table in, in Excel because you can go up here and select any time period you want. Yesterday, month to date, year to date, last year, last month, whatever. I just chose year to date just because it's a nice, uh, kind of a nice round figure. But what's really neat is this is the real data. <laughs> this isn't a screenshot that scraped yesterday or the beginning of the week. This is real live data as transactions are going through. And um, uh, one of the things that you guys are going to be interested in is uh, and again, think of this as you roll up all of your collection agencies under one, or you can go in individually and see how each one is doing there. Uh, so transactionally, uh, under the transaction screen, you've got uh, the presentment that happens, unsuccessful uh, purchases, presented returns, all the, the, the specifics as it relates to what's happening with all of those transactions flowing through the pipeline. Um, and we are very much uh, uh, into full disclosure. I mean, uh, 
full disclosure, as you can see, we have all of the rates uh, down here on the right hand side where my arrow's pointing. Everything is is lined out in detail. And again, this is real time for that entire period, January to the end of May. Uh, we can go by total transactions. We can go declines that might have happened uh, during that same time period. Any chargebacks, don't know how regular that'll happen, but we, we do post everything. Uh, we have this little dashboard meter here. Uh, chargeback is a big indicator to the underwriting bank as to whether you're a, a good client or a bad client. And we have thresholds based upon uh, your uh, business type. And then the dashboard will say, you know, we'll show uh, one tenth of a percent of your sales and uh, 11 tenths of your volume. You're well within the green and you don't need to be worrying about the chargeback side. Um, this is a new one that's going to be coming out soon, but I kind of have in my mind's eye, uh, financial know your customer, you'll be able to see the trends happening with each of your collection groups that we can uh, put in there that you'll have a, a dashboard to go ahead and see how all of those groups are doing uh, of the commits that they've got in payment, how many have come through, what are the number of charges, uh, the unique customers they've got, everything will be sitting there. Also, uh, we have an opportunity page, which is let's, for- a Let's pause for just a second, David, and go back to financial KYC. Guys, we talked about this a little bit, was also the part of the, the end consumer being inside part of this, because you're gonna have multiple different partners you're collecting for, but they might have the same consumer at the end of the day that are, both, that are in collections with, against multiple people. So this is another good place to be able to see what we're seeing as habit or history on a consumer inside of our system that we can forewarn you of, hey, they go into agreements, but don't actually pay them all the way through, or they only successfully hit three out of their six payments, that sort of stuff. So there's a lot of good data on the consumer as well as not only their payment transaction history, but what is their history in the industry? What are the type of cards that they have? What are the type of um credit lines they might have and you guys can well i don't know if you guys will see that but you're as a collection company you can often look at credit to see what they're holding but we're able to see how they're spending against that so i think those are some of the places where as our version 8 rolls out we're looking here in the next month or so that it'll hold a lot of consumer-based data that a lot of our clients will use for marketing, but you guys might use for decisions on what type of offer you might offer them. Also, the, the, we can go ahead and program this by collection agency as well to give you a trend and say, this, collect, this collection agency is either being really, really too strict or way too lenient because the collective group on average is defaulting 20% more than anybody else. So it's a, a really good yardstick for you to be able to help better manage the affiliates with whom you're you're working. Um, the opportunity page that I'm on right here, uh, no matter what the business is, you're gonna have fallout. Uh, this particular business, since it's a recurring uh, billing business, they have a lot more fallout than say a, a direct purchase of just one item here, one item there, uh, or a card present purchase. So of all of their billing they've done year to date, we are able to match and look and say, you didn't get paid on all, more than a half a million dollars of uh, of all that monies, and they fall into these buckets. And again, this is real time, real data uh, that we're going back and looking at to the penny of the transaction, whatever that bucket might be: sales rejects, insufficient funds, uh, fixable items, do not honors, whatever it might be. Then, on top of that, because of our uh, authenticity and transparency, which we really work hard to be, we say, what's the average success ratio for our from from these buckets that we believe you can collect on? So of that 541,000, we believe that there's probably 320,000 that can be collected on. And again, think of this as an aggregate view for all your clients that you're working with or an individual group for a collection agency. You could look at it either way. We also report on how well the um, uh, the customer has done against going back and collecting on this. And one of the exciting things that we're looking forward to in the next uh, 30, 45 days, uh, we're gonna be testing this on an automated basis where 
the client doesn't need to go in and use our tools that we have to collect this monies, but we'll be able to do it automatically and then charge them on a performance basis for how much we actually collect for them. So of the 541,000, these guys we believed had 310,000 in capabilities to, to recover. They only did 60 and you can see areas like do not honor, they didn't even touch. So we're working with them to get better. We're excited to uh, get them on the uh, automated product as it comes out. The last thing I'm gonna show you today is accounting. And accounting, if any of you are on the financial side or program for the financial side, know what a hassle this is. Uh, getting all of the transactions reconciled so you know exactly where your costs sit by the type of cost that you put into your specific journal entries. And I'm gonna do a reconciliation of this company for an entire almost six month period, uh, gap uh, formatted in what was that, about four seconds. So these are journal entries that would then be uh, through an API, go back to whatever ERP the company is using to be able to load up into their uh, in, into their financial package, whether, whether it's um, uh, NetSuite or Acorn or uh, QuickBooks or whatever it might be, and be able to reconcile in just that amount of time. And if you've ever done this kind of work, you know that this is very labor intensive. In fact, we check with our clients and ones that we're working with uh, that we're selling right now, we find that it for about for every 125,000 in sales or collections of, uh, of credit card, debit cards, uh, it takes about one man hour per month to reconcile. So you can do the math on that. So very powerful, very useful, and there's a boatload of reports that can be driven off the back end of this. Uh, if, if you, if the, uh, the customer wants to have a specific report or you guys see something specific uh, under our reports, we can add other ones. We have do not honor report that shows the ones that come back from uh, the um, card brand saying do not honor. A shipping report, you can imagine for a network marketing company, this could be uh, worth its weight in gold. You don't ship until the money is actually in your bank not that you've received an approval, but you've actually, it's actually hit your bank. Uh, card expired report, this could be a big advantage for, you, uh, for your um, uh, collection agencies. This can tell you in advance, uh, when is that card gonna expire? So you might have a, th a six month contract to collect this debt, but yet their card's gonna expire two months into it. This, this will alert you in advance to say, you need to get another, you need to get a new card or you need to get the correct expiration date. So lots of good stuff there. Uh, any questions? I know that was kind of a fast one. Um, is all of this data that you're showing, uh, like that that card uh, export or the expired piece was uh, really interesting, but also the, the KYC, is a lot of that um, available outside of your system? Like is it uh, via APIs or anything that we could – uh, take and leverage that data how we see fit, or is this only a you know a WYSIWYG that uh, with, you know a GUI we have to come in and and manually look at these things and take those actions? Um, yeah, easy answer. Yeah, it's available outside of this. So we we built this very specifically to make that possible. All of this front end runs off of our API. So. Um, we we keep that api relatively private and so it's not a, a public out there open source api that anyone can go hit so we have to set up the account and then with anybody who's hitting that api especially with our compliance and security stuff um, we have to set the permissions to allow you to hit certain portions of that api but at the end of the day let's say we came and put it together and said great you just you don't even want to look at this right you just want to pull it all into your own system that API, this exact same data is available. The other part that's available is all of these parts, let's call this the, you know, the accounting tab or the fees tab, whatever that is, right? Those are all built off of queries that we have pre-built. And those are also available in that API. So you could go and say, instead of pulling the data in or running your own query against it, you could say, I just want to pull in the financial KYC report that's already been pre-built by us, and then you could pop that in your own system if you wanted to. Excellent. Cool.
Okay. Um, I had a question. Um, maybe, maybe I didn't follow this like that, that carefully, but there was there was something said about some sort of estimate of how much the uh, the payer is able to pay, and then a report of how much that they have paid in the recent past. Um, did I did I get that right? Uh, yeah, so I can explain that a little bit better for you on what we do on our end with the data that we have. So, um, again, we're, we're getting thousands of points of data on an individual transaction. And depending on the type of card and the issuing bank and that sort of stuff, there's a lot of times where what we're receiving is spend history outside of that one transaction. And it's not going to tell me where it's being spent, but it is going to be able to tell me things similar to hey, this customer on average spends $100 per transaction or $30 per transaction. Um, they did on this card 128 transactions in the last month, right? Things like that. There is data that is available on that. Some of that we don't, we don't even provide at all through this yet because we haven't had a customer or a partner that mm, was, uh, needed it is probably the best way to say that, right? Um, someone who knew what to do with it is probably a better way to say that. So the answer is yes. Let's let's imagine someone comes in, and this would be a fun example of this. Someone comes in, you offer them three payments of you know eighty dollars a month, right? And you run that transaction and settlement that comes back, and and it's not live, right? You're getting that during the settlement phase, so it's an overnight sort of thing for us to get all of that data in. And it comes back, and we find out, oh well, their average transaction is actually one hundred and sixty-five dollars. Well, you might want to go back and be like, I know their average transaction is 165 bucks. We're charging them 80 bucks. What if I went back and offered them $150 to pay off the rest so I can get that right now rather than get that over the next three months, right? So there's a lot of extra little tidbits of data we hold in those thousands of points of data. Today, what's displayed and is part of our, our dashboard are the things that our merchants or our partners have needed access to or that we've built out specialty things. We haven't gone as far because I haven't had someone needing that type of data. Oh, that's okay. I'm just trying, I just want to make sure that I have a clear understanding of what's being shown here, where it comes from. So if to repeat this back, you guys on your end may or may not have a spend history for a card. And then your dashboard will show some aggregated information, uh, you know, based on that spend history. If I have it. Yeah. So if you have it. And that KYC side of things, right? And that would also be available in the API. But yeah, if I'm getting a note or I'm, I'm getting a code from the from the issuer, from whoever that gives me information, we hold it, we house it inside of our tables. It may not be available at this point inside this dashboard, but as we meet and talk about what your needs are, I may be able to say, oh, well, we have data that does this. And you could come and say, hey, do you have something that does this and this and this? Like, oh yeah, let's open those data points up for you. Um, instead of, I, I mean, we could we could try the path of, hey, here's 4,000 data points that we have access to, and you could look and pick and choose. But I think it, I think for what we're doing together, it's going to be kind of an ebb and flow of deciding, okay, we've got these things available, we've got these things, we have this new query that's coming up. And the industry's data is always changing, which is frustrating for us, because one day I might get that code, and the next day I might not. And so we just house it all together and we aggregate that data on a per customer basis. And that way it's easy to go in and say, hey, we know something about this customer already, or you just charge them today and we know better for tomorrow what we should be billing them, things like that. Okay, okay, that, that's all very interesting. And I know, I, I don't wanna derail this too much, but um, what is, is, it, is it even remotely possible to get information about cards associated with a name and social security number before that person has attempted to engage with us so if we if we have like a name and some personal identifying information is that a, like a completely out of the question thing to see what cards are associated with that identity and then see what spend history is associated with that and then try to compute an offer up front yeah so the answer is I'm going to tentatively in that say no, but it's not a, it's an out of the question scenario. It's a, there's not enough aggregated data or enough transparency in the space for anybody today to do that yet outside of the people that we already have. 
right? So I see. Okay, so you have to act. You're the aggregator, is what I. We thought. are. Okay. Yeah. So. Okay. So yeah, like e- even in even like when you run credit, right? And and that's an interesting thing, right? Is that in the industry, a card number is not associated with a with a social security number or an individual in that sense. The only way that the industry is seeing that I've got a card is because that gets reported to credit. So now I go and I say, oh, this person's got a $5,000 line of credit at American Express, but they don't know what number that is definitely. And so it's really hard to see that. So until we're in the position where we've got millions and millions and millions and millions of users in the system that are gonna overlap when you look. So a, a good example is right now, inside of our system, if we went to one of our MLMs and I wrote, you know, Sally Sue Johnson, it's gonna pull up every single card number she's ever used there. Then on top of that, if I have another one of those MLMs and Sally Sue Johnson has been over there, I'm gonna see any card she's used over there and aggregate that together. What I'm not doing is I can't go to MLM number one and say, here's the whole list of all the cards across all everywhere we see Sally Sue. I don't do that for them today. For you guys, it might be a different scenario. Um, We'd have to work through some permission-based items on your clients to be able to say, yes, this client has permission for you to see the data and to use that against your other collection people you might be working on. So anyways, the easy answer to that was no, but I went in depth to say, I really, really have a good goal and a good path that as we continue to aggregate this, that it'll have more and more and more of that success. And we look at it, you're looking at it as, hey, what kind of an offer can we give? We look at it as, hey, who are the bad actors in the space you should be blocking? Because no one's out there doing bounce checks anymore because it's way easier to do the transaction and charge it back tomorrow and get all my money back and keep the clothes, right? Are and you so- able to get that type of information before doing a transaction with the person? If I already had data on that person and we had enough valid information from you to compare it into our database and say, hey, yes, I already have data on this person, um, there is an opportunity. I'm going to have to look at regulation on that side of things with the card brands and and some compliance with the bank side of things on what I can share to you. Um, It might not be. so, So another good example is to our clients, I can give a risk score. So let's say I see bad data on a client from, I mean, on a customer from client one, I could warn client two a score on that customer, but I couldn't tell them what happened, right? Due to uh, confidentiality between the the merchant themselves and my customers I have to hold there. For you guys, we might be able to play some certain things to say, hey, a score of 10 is good and a score of one is bad or one to five, and you would know when when running that person if they are at a risk score, if that's high or low, right? So there's some things we can do, but it's it's difficult for me to just to give the data to you that belongs to a different merchant. Sure. No, understood. But I, I love the, the risk score. I mean, that's a, definitely a good place to start. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I would say that we we love what we do. Um, and we've built what's been needed for our merchants, our clients, now for the banks and the processors. And so because we have so much data, we haven't gone through all of it and built all the cool things that are possible. We're looking at this being more of a platform than us being the answer to everything. And so as you guys look at this, I'm looking and saying, okay, how can we be the platform you want to build your payments and data analytics on so that we're providing you everything we've got and you can decide what, what you want to run as well as look at all the things we've already built and say, I need these 10 things out of the 50 things you already built. We already want that in our system. And so I think that's a good kind of partnership to build out success so that you're not waiting on me to build the thing you want built. Or it will say, hey, yep, here's the data, build away. Do you have a list of those quote unquote things you've already got built that we could review? Yeah. Yeah. Because we're, you know, somewhat, you know, we're, we're, we're at an interesting stage where we, have a good we ha, we there's like three spaces there's the spaces that we really know what we're talking about we've got the space where we kind of know and we think there might be something and then there's that third space of we didn't even know that that existed and i'm sure there's going to be a lot of those we didn't know that existed in your list of things that you guys are already doing 
Yeah, I would say I would say the first and easy list is kind of an outline of everything that's available inside of our dashboard for our merchants today. That's what you're going to instantly get access to both through API and the dashboard on your on having an account with us and running data through. The harder one is then going to be the next step that says, here's all the extra data points that aren't yet being displayed in here and reviewing that with you and saying, are any of these of interest for you to be able to run analytics against? And either do you want us to build the queries for that or do you have your own queries you want to write inside your system and just pull in that data? And so I think that those are kind of the first two steps in viewing what we have on the data side of things different than just running a transaction for your client. And what's the threshold for doing something new um, with you guys? I mean, I, where I work today, my, my day job, if a customer wants something new, I, I write a, an SOW, put a dollar sign next to it and hand it to them and they decide if they want to pay that to make it happen. What, what's that relationship look like with you uh, for something new? Um, I haven't done that before. In, in truth, um, outside of like specialty reports inside of our software, right? So if our clients come and say, hey, we're having a problem with this and we can we can write the queries or the or pull the information from the database to be able to show them saying, hey, here's the solution. That's something we're just providing to our clients today. Um, in regards to- So we to, get everything, everything we ask for for free. I love it. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> <Maybe set. laughs> exactly. Yeah, I, I would say, you know, uh, obviously development costs. And so it, it would be probably behoove us to have a little bit of a conversation in the space of what do you guys want to be able to do and what could you use help on? And, and right, we're really good at running analytics, right? We're really good at that. And so you may come and say, hey, instead of me pulling your data in and writing all of this stuff to write all the analytics to get the answer that we want, can you just get us the answer that we want from the data and you guys write it? that's that's great then it's just gonna be us looking at development time right and then what's our bandwidth so i i think that's the normal answer you're going to get from most cases it's hard to answer it when i don't know what you want sure and so no, you know i could build you a spaceship but <laughs> you know that's that's probably about it i won't take you to the moon i'll build you the spaceship though i think uh and Crete, pull me back if i'm getting too far ahead of us here um I would envision from our data science perspective that we're more interested in just asking you for every piece of raw information you have about a card. And, um, and then we'll do the analytics on our back end. I see us getting to a point like that. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so the answer, ten I'm going to say tentatively on that. Because every single time I say this, I'm going to underline it with as long as I'm still in compliance, right? Sure. So as long as I'm allowed to share it with you, right? And and I would say out of most of our data points, there's not a ton we can't share. And sometimes it's the fun space where if I share X, I can't share Y, right? So we have to kind of play with that game a little bit. But in general, I would say that what your goal and what you're looking for is something that is very, very feasible and exciting for us because that is where we want to be, right? I'd rather be able to open this up, say, here's the data that's available, go for it, right? Pull it all in there. Um, and uh, um, But in the short term, while you're trying to build probably, you know, your proof of concept as well as your minimum viable product, <laughs> there's probably a lot of the work that you're looking to get done that we may have already programmed and already built so that you could just start leveraging that off the base stuff we already have. And then as you grow and and continue down that path, you might say, okay, great. Yep. Now we want to be tapping into this, but it's, it's not any different than more API, you know, more API stuff. Um, and we just have to make sure that anything that you're receiving from us is cleaned up and funneled off so that it's compliant. Sure. Okay. Um, can we talk about uh, you know, I wanted to open up to, I know Bruce had a drop, so maybe uh, Phil or and or Alex, as far as what questions do you guys have on my team regarding uh, any API integration work? Um, sorry, that, that's a tough one for me to 
to jump on. I, I joined in super late because um, I was in a call with another or with my day job. Um, so I'm I'm not sure what all was covered so far. Um, sure. Uh, well, uh, maybe uh, so eight uh, team. Uh, David and Preston, uh, do you guys want to uh, give us a run through on what the API integration uh, will would look like? Yeah, I, I can give you a quick. I can give you an overview. Um, I can tell you that probably best as as we take the next step to put you guys on with Bob, who's our CTO and can do a much better job at using the good words that I should be using, but I don't know. Um, but tentative overview is you need to uh, to run a payment is a gateway integration to get data from the system and reporting from the system is a different API integration. One is really quite easy. Um, uh, and, so NMI is the one I'd suggest. We can get you sandbox there. If you have a different gateway you love, we can get you there. We can board onto anybody. Um, that's that's the, I want to be able to send a transaction into the industry onto a host of payments page and you guys want to do it this way because you don't want to go into PCI level one compliance. But that's just going to, you're never going to want to do that. So you don't want to be collecting and housing that card number. You want to be tokenizing that card number is going to be my suggestion. Um, if you want to do something different, then we can talk through getting you PCI tier one compliant, which is fine. Um, the API integration to our side of things is, again, we have, I think it's, if I use the wrong word and I say SOAP API, hopefully that makes sense to you guys. Um, but, uh, I mean, we, we open up, we have to whitelist your endpoints, um, and then, uh, give you guys access to the API and Bob can send over all the documentation for that. Um, and then the, we would put in dummy data into your guys' account so you can play with that dummy data until you're ready to actually go live and start running transactions. And then we'd, we'd, uh, activate your live account. So you'd, you'd pretty much just be in a sandbox account to be able to, see what data is available already on the current API. And then the full data, if we're going to open it up and you're saying, hey, just drop us everything that's ever possible, every card number that we ever run, that's going to be a little bit of a conversation with Bob to say, okay, great, how are we going to do this? And my guess is that instead of it, I mean, we, we do it a couple of different ways, but when we pull it in, we clean it up and put it in our tables, we could probably just give you guys direct access to those tables to pull data from rather than having to run an API to come search for that. So there's a few different ways to be able to pull to pull off getting you the full amount of data, which is different than, hey, here you're using our reporting tools that we've already built and all the queries and all the stuff we've already done. Hopefully that made sense. Okay, sounds good. Alex or Phil, any questions at this point? Mm, nothing for me, that's not good. Okay. I think first step is probably getting you guys API access to the gateway level. That's the part to be able that's gonna get it so you can run transactions. Once you're once you've got that and that makes sense and you're good to go on that, then um, and you know, pretty much if we want to schedule something next week, whatever, throw throw the tech guys on the call so that the rest of us who don't know what they're talking about don't have to listen to it. Um Amen. Have to do that too. <laughs> Okay, sounds good. Okay. David or Sean, do you guys have any questions or Ben? None for me. No, I don't have any at this time, thanks. And so when do you guys all quit your day jobs and go into this full time? <laughs> um, if everything goes to plan next week, let's get that <laughs> API going. <laughs> cool. Do it. <laughs> Yeah, we've already got uh, two uh, two customers lined up that are working with us, and we've got a, a great path to success here, especially with the partnership and the, the help you guys are providing. We're excited. Yeah, yeah the payment piece is much more integral than uh, when Paul first told me about it, and I started to think through it. It's like, wow, payments on this is much more important than some of the other clients we deal with. Very true. Yeah. Okay. So, Preston, I I text you Cree's information. Um, yeah. I'll just put an email together with all of us and then send that over, and then yeah. we can get the account set up and get rocking and rolling, and then get scheduled for the IT guys to chat away from what things they have, what questions. 
Okay. All right, great. Awesome, guys. This has been great. Thanks so much. Appreciate it, everybody. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Dave. Thanks, everybody. See ya.